and we are recording. Okay, so welcome everyone to the artist Q&A for uh, my newly curated show, Immortal Interventions in Time, which is showing right now at Automat Collective Gallery. Um, if you're new to Automat, we are a primarily artist-run gallery space. We have 10 members and most of them are artists, although we do have one member that focuses uh, purely on curation. And we have recently moved to the Crane Arts Building at 1400 North American Street. So um, we are trying to resolve a little issue with Google right now. So if you Google our address, it will still show our old address at 319 North 11th Street, um, which we still have wonderful connections with our you know, old gallery neighbors there. Um, but please use the address on our website, uh, and I will also plug it in the chat here um, on our website and our social media, uh, including our Instagram and Facebook page. Uh, so that is our new address. So if you're looking for us or if you want to see the show, that is where you can go. Uh, the show will officially be um, having its opening reception tomorrow evening from six to nine. And so if you're in the Philadelphia area, we would love to see you there. But if you can't make it, it will also be open on Saturdays from 12 to five through April 2nd. So um, all of those hours are posted on our website. And um, if you need to get in touch with us, this is our website and our email address. So I will pop that in the chat as well. Um, all right, so I'm, uh, I'm going to just start off by introducing myself. My name is Jacqueline Yvonne Toll. Um, I sometimes go by Jacqueline Yvonne as my artist name. I'm a sculpture artist and a member of Automat Collective and my own studio work explores the relationship that people have with sentimental objects like collectibles, souvenirs, um, and other objects that kind of don't perform a overt function but um, serve a, a meaningful purpose to the owner. And I think a lot about why these objects are important to people and how they kind of relate to our own limitations of our body and our mortality and things like that. So this is my first uh, solo curation at Automat. And I took this opportunity to explore those same ideas that I'm really interested in in the studio, but through uh, other artists' work. So I've included in the show um, paintings, textile sculpture, taxidermy, and restored furniture. So we have three of our four artists with us today, unfortunately, Alexander hasn't been able to make it. Hopefully he can join um, at some point, but if not, I will talk about his work. Um, and so we have Divya and Theremin. Did I say that right, Divya? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Caitlin McCormick, who is a local Philadelphia artist, and then Celeste Morton, who is our painter, and um, also Alexander O'Hara, who is our furniture restoration expert. Um, who isn't with us uh, at, at this moment. But um, the way that I would like to start off is just by kind of introducing each of the artists and then following up with a question. And we'll just kind of go around um, and sort of in a conversational way, talk about the show a little bit and the work. And then we will open the floor to folks in the chat, if you would like to submit a question, um, please do so in the chat. If you would like to wait a little bit so that your um, question doesn't get lost at all, um, please feel free to do so. So I'll, I'll give you a heads up when we'll be uh, looking at the chat for questions. So my first question goes to Divya, who is a taxidermy artist based in the Bronx, New York, and specializes in birds and small mammals that are commissioned for both artistic and scientific clients, including private clients, high-end designers, museums, and educational facilities. And Divya also provides limited in-person courses in taxidermy and has a passion for conservation and education. So welcome Divya, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you for having me. Yeah, um, so can you talk about 
why you think taxidermy is an important practice and what purposes uh, taxidermy serves for kind of humans. Like this is kind of an interesting behavior that humans do is trying to preserve animals in these, um, these, this illusion of a living state. So what do you think people get out of taxidermy and why, why do we do it and look at it and things like that? Sure. So, um, I mean, for me personally, taxidermy was really valuable because, um, um, like I grew up in a big city. So unlike a lot of other practices, like going to the park and bird watching and these things that you can do in a city and that they are there, um, the animals are always moving around, you know, they're always flying and there's only so much, um, there's only so much the average person who doesn't have a very fancy scope or binoculars or something like that. There's only so much you can observe. So taxidermy, seeing it in museums and stuff when I was younger, um, you know, aside from seeing the beauty of the animal, there was there were these moments of stillness you can have with an animal. Um, and those moments of stillness are so valuable and they kind of, I mean, they just transcend just that scientific aspect of taxidermy. You know, we're always talking about it as a record of taxonomy, but it's also just a way of remembering something and seeing, um, because it's something made by a person, you're also seeing that person's, as much as they try not to inject themselves too far in there, you do see that person's hand, you do see that person's attitude. Um, you can probably see their mood for the day. You know, you can see all sorts of things um, based on how someone chose to preserve, to preserve this animal. So, um, you know, those, that stillness that we have with taxidermy, you can sit with a piece of taxidermy for hours. Um, or if you're in, you know, if you're in a gallery or museum, probably until the museum and gallery closes. But you can really have so much time spent with an animal and get so close to it in a way that you can't um, in nature, and, and and in a way that's probably unsafe in nature too. So, for me, that that spending that time with an animal, getting close, all of that stillness is the most um, is the most important thing, and I think um, my favorite thing about taxidermy. Yeah, I find that super interesting because, um, you know, when I'm thinking about the themes of the show and uh, how, you know, we kind of hold on to objects or, you know, things that we pass down from other generations of people. And um, so it's kind of like this, that ties into this whole practice of uh, sort of trying to capture moments in time um, and, you know, making them still so that we can be present with them for a longer period of time. So um, I love how you worded that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, great. So my next question is for Caitlin, uh, who is an artist based in Philadelphia that creates fiber sculptures, which acknowledge the transgenerational legacy of craft in her family and um, also externalize personal experiences with mental illness, abuse and assault, uh, resulting in an intimate archive of emotional vessels, often using vintage fabrics and found materials um, and exploring notions such as fabrication versus reality, inauthenticity versus accuracy and animation versus death. Um, so thank you so much for joining us and um, congratulations on your acceptance into Wasaic Residency, which is where uh, Caitlin is right now. Um, so my question for you is uh, about found materials and objects in your work, which uh, you incorporate quite a bit. Can you talk about the use of found objects such as doilies um, and what they provide for you when you're making work in the studio? Um, so a lot of, a, a lot of my work is, um, hinged on contending with trauma through the construction of a personal mythology. And, um, I've done a lot of thinking about how to articulate this over the past decade, because I, I'm continuing to broaden the types of objects I incorporate into my work and how I source them. But I think that initially, because my materials are so limited, I, I work pretty much exclusively with crocheted cotton string that's stiffened with glue. Um, 
I strove to broaden the set of symbols that I was working with. And, and the, um, I wanted to broaden the mythology itself by incorporating other potential stories into my own narrative. Um, so, you know, when I, when I use an object that I've found at a estate sale or, um, you know, a piece of vintage fabric that has either an unknown or a known story, I'm kind of like, kind of glomming onto it and, and allowing it to augment my own narrative that I've been incorporating into my work. And I'm kind of um, using that as a, as a totem for um, storing my own grief or my own trauma, if that makes any sense. Jackie, I think you went. You went muted. Sorry, I'm back trying okay. to manage <laughs> too many screens at once. Um, so yeah, that makes a lot of sense, and I think that uh, you know, especially craft or you know processes with the hand in making are used in a therapeutic way for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure that that resonates with a lot of people and using found objects and materials in your work, um, or at least uh, materials that kind of recall found objects like doilies um, must tie into like larger traditions and histories for you yeah. um, that, that wouldn't necessarily be there without um, or with, you know, um, making something completely from scratch or from, um, you know, a more sort of just raw material, if, mm -hmm. if you agree with that. Yeah. So, um, all right. Well, thank you so much for answering that question. I'm going to continue to work my way around here. Um, and my next question is for Celeste. Uh, who is based in Brooklyn and makes paintings from images and objects that she finds intriguing, mysterious, absurd, and or ambiguous. Uh, many of these images come from children's movies, paintings, objects, or photographs from performative spaces such as a, the rodeo. The paintings typically depict a turning point in a narrative uh, or a moment before the next big event happens and are the result of storytelling and the feeling of sort of incompletion from stories that may never be fully told. Um, <clears throat> so thank you for joining us, Celeste. And uh, you. can you talk about um, how you view the process of painting? Um, do you view it as an act of preservation uh, among other things and what kinds of things do you think are being preserved as you paint? Yeah, I've been thinking about that question a lot in um, regards to the show. Um, and I do think it's an act of preservation and kind of what Divya was saying about um, freezing a moment in time is something that I'm very interested in in my paintings. So especially if there's a moment of action that I'm, um, you know, freezing and painting from, whether that's a still from a movie or, um, you know, some kind of image I find. But I think that preservation is kind of, um, in painting the preservation of the self is occurring um, and uh, specifically language, the preservation of language. So, um, in the artist's own language. So when I look at a painting that I really love, I'm kind of looking for the choices the artist made. Um, and it, this extends beyond painting too, but um, for me, it's trying to view and understand the hand of the artist, the artist's own language. And that to me is really, interesting because it's totally different for every artist, but also sometimes for every 
painting or piece of art. I know that for me, um, it changes every time I make a painting. You know, language is constantly shifting and changing and um, painting is a way of preserving that shifting, I guess. Yeah, that's really interesting that it kind of, uh, as you paint, I would assume that everything is kind of shifting around and moving, but then it kind of settles into this state that becomes, um, you know, has like a sense of permanence, I suppose, of, of that mm -hmm. moment in time and, you know, where your identity was at that time. Um, just like Divya was talking about with, you know, you can sort of see the artist behind the, the taxidermy as well as, you know, the animal um, that's being preserved in a way. Um, and that's not something that I've necessarily thought about when I look at taxidermy, but I, I would assume that like as someone who's been doing it for a long time, you can kind of tease apart, you know, how different artists would approach preserving different um, animals and, and posing them. And there's a lot of creative choice that goes into um, all of those things. And, and it's the same for, you know, painting or sculpture, or any other art, I suppose. So. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, so I would like to talk about Alexander O'Hara's work, uh, even though he wasn't able to make it here with us. Um, Alexander O'Hara has been practicing furniture restoration and repair in the Philadelphia area for the last 20 years. And it was a craft that was passed down to him from his father, who was uh, primarily a cabinet maker, but also made furniture. Um, and then Alexander grew up kind of uh, designing spindles and uh, spindles for tables and chair legs for his father's business. Uh, and he actually furniture restoration, he has several brothers and um, furniture restoration and repair remains the primary specialty for he and I think five of his other brothers. Uh, and he just gets a lot of fulfillment. I was able to visit his workshop uh, and, and he just takes so much pride in his work and um, puts a lot of devotion and beauty into restoring these pieces, some of which come to him just like completely fallen apart. And he, you know, has these magical ways of transforming these pieces. So you'll get to see uh, a number of his pieces if you are if you visit the show, and um, and they're supporting some of the work of the other artists in the show, and uh, it's kind of a really special thing that we were able to curate all of these things in a way that sort of visually tie together and speak to each other, um, and the artists were very gracious and giving me the creative freedom to do that. So. Um, I'm, re I'm really excited about that. Um, um, Jackie, we have a request to turn your mic up if you're able to. Uh, sorry, yes, my microphone, I've had some issues with it. Is that better if I hold it up like this? Yeah, I've been, let me see if I can turn up the audio setting. <clears throat> yeah, the microphone is up all the way, but I will try to hold this up and speak louder. So thank you for letting me know that. I think that's better. Um, so, I'm going to go back to Divya, um, and if you could talk to me about some of your personal goals, like what, what your thought process is going into a taxidermy piece and what you're trying to achieve with it, and then um, beyond that, what are your kind of ethics regarding taxidermy? Like, what are your personal do's and don'ts? And... Um, you know, how you might respond to someone that, you know, might feel uncomfortable with the idea of taxidermy. Sure. So um, I think the, per like, I think an overarching or like an overreaching goal of mine is to get people to care about animals. Um, you know, again, in those moments of stillness, I want them to contemplate their own relationship to animals and to nature. Um, and to improve that relationship or to, you know, to deepen that relationship. And it can be something as little as maybe they'll make more time to go bird watching or join a, you know, or join some 
some conservation effort in their area, or it can be something as small as just spending, you know, five more minutes outside looking at a tree, um, which is a lot more realistic than, you know, than doing some grand gesture and to find the value in all of that. Um, I think more practically, like day to day, my goal is making sure that I'm doing the best I can for each animal I work on. Um, I want to make sure that they're as, you know, that they look as true to, you know, as true to nature as possible or as, um, as I, I guess it's my own ideal, honestly, that I'm reflecting on them. Like I want them to be as, you know, as compelling and I want the story that the animal tells to sort of be, um, to be one that, that inspires someone to think of the, to think of wonder and awe and curiosity as opposed to something, um, as opposed to something that is, I guess, morbid or negative or something, something that I think people often associate with taxidermy is, is a lot of these, a lot of these feelings of, um, you know, of course, death is part of it. Death is a part of the life cycle, but I feel like there is so much of a negative attitude around all of that. So I'd want people to realize that, you know, death is a part of the life cycle, but it's not necessarily something we should run and hide from. Um, if anything, it should inform us how valuable life is. Um, and as far as ethics go, I would say, you know, anything I work on, uh, I work on mostly birds. So almost all of them are domestically raised. Um, the few wild birds I get, they're from museums or other like educational clients that, um, you know, that are only legal for them to possess. So those are, you know, those are sort of, I have to work under those ethics for not just my own beliefs, but because of the laws. Um, and, you know, there is like, you know, there's a very popular term in taxidermy these days saying ethically sourced, um, but ethics are so personal. And I think the more I've done this, I've realized that a lot of the ideas that I've had, um, especially as a person growing up in the city around things like hunting, around things like people, you know, uh, people going in nature and going hunting and things like that, um, a lot of my opinions about that were very ill-informed and actually doing taxidermy and meeting people, meeting all different kinds of hunters, meeting the, meeting what we think of as a stereotypical hunter, like the guy that wants to get the biggest thing and doesn't really care about anything else. And then meeting someone who does it for sustenance, who does it for food and who does it, um, you know, who does it as a way to connect with nature, seeing that there's an expansive reality there. Um, and, and a variety of, of approaches um, is, what, is what has helped me expand my own, uh, you know, expand my own ideas around, around what is an ethical taxidermist or what isn't. Um, personally, I am, I'm, you know, because of the nature of what I work on, I'm always working with domestic, you know, with domestic and naturally deceased birds. Um, but I always want to include that bit about hunting because often people are like they lump all hunters in together and it's just not you know it's just not the case um if so for those who choose to eat meat I guess um I think beyond that too is just because something is legal doesn't mean it's ethical also I guess on the other side of that um there's a lot of there's a lot of very commonly traded specimens like bats for example that are legal to sell in many, you know, in many cases, but I personally don't feel good ethically, um, you know, using bats in my work because um, they're often imported from other, they're often imported from other places and not really, you know, there aren't really good uh, practices behind their harvest. So if I can't certify or if I can't feel comfortable with how something was harvested, I don't want to use it in my work. Um, so there's just constantly like the ethics have to be constantly informed by, you know, asking questions and being on top of the laws and being on top of um, just being on top of knowing what people say versus what they're doing, I guess. Um, yeah. Oh, that's wonderfully informative. Thank you. Um, Thanks. Yeah. And, and I, I can totally relate from, you know, meeting hunters and how yeah. passionate they can be about nature and also conservation and things like that. Yeah, for um, sure. Yeah. And I, I, I think that um, it, it's really like 
great that you have these sorts of connections with these educational institutions and that you you can kind of receive um, almost give the the animal another life because they they almost they served like a an educational purpose in life and then they can continue that journey um, after death you know with your intervention so um, <laughs> that's that's really interesting and exciting to me thank you um, so I'll, uh, I'll move over to Caitlin again. Um, and I sort of piggybacking off of our uh, conversation with Divya, um, much of your work resembles sort of remains of once living organisms. And um, if you could just talk about sort of the influence of mortality and, um, and you know, nature in, in your work. Um. So um, my work or its, its current form sort of came out of a, um, a period of grieving and mourning within my family. Um, I didn't initially intend to make these osteological specimens. Um, I was, you know, my, my grandmother was, you know, starting to decline after, you know, very shortly after my grandfather had passed away and um, my family members and I were spending a lot of time um, in their house and I was just kind of using her crochet materials because she she had taught me how to crochet um, to generate just these organic shapes. Um, but it was with this bone colored antique cotton thread that she and her sister did, sisters had used to make doilies in, during the depression, you know, in World War II. Um, so I, you know, I thought this is actually kind of, it kind of resembles a bone. Um, so I started to apply, you know, these different glue experimentations to the, the material. And I realized that it actually resembled um, bone tissue viewed through a microscope. Um, and that inspired me to create these skeletal forms and sew the pieces together and, you know, make them increasingly more delicate and fragile looking. But in, in reality, they're actually weirdly sturdy. Um, they look brittle, but they're, I, I throw them across the room all the time just for the hell of it. Um, but, uh, you know, the more I familiarized myself with this skeletal subject matter, the more I realized that I was, um, and I, I think I touched on this when I was stumbling through my last response to your question, but um, I, I sort of use these husk-like forms or, you know, skeletons to serve as totems or almost like symbolic embodiments of my traumatic memories. And they're unraveling and they're becoming, you know, increasingly faded and, and um, it more ambiguous and harder to decipher as time goes on. Um, and I, um, I think that I, I draw a lot of inspiration from, from taxidermy in the sense that um, I, and museum, like scientific and medical museum um, exhibition design also, or it's another huge influence, but I, um, I draw influences from those things to kind of um, take these totems of painful memories and traumatic events and um, pin them in a static composition in this, you know, beautiful rhizospheric environment, you know, with flora and, you know, um, mushrooms and things so that I can hang it on a wall and stand as far as I can away from it and observe it from a distance. And that's, it's honestly, you know, over the last 10 years, it's become integral to my ability to process trauma is creating these objects. So it's, it's, you know, they're skeletons and they're husks and it, it is incredibly death oriented work, but it's also, you know, it's simultaneously my attempt to move on. So it's also about growth. Right, and that touches on kind of what we were talking about earlier with um, sort of death being embraced as a part of life and sort of being an opportunity to um, grow into something new or become something new. So yeah. thank you. Um, and that's, and I'm sure that that 
sort of tradition that you're carrying on um, from the craft that you inherited from your grandmother is is in a way tying you to this connection and this history with her and with a part of your identity as well. So, um, so yeah, it's both object and process. I'm sure that's really, really wonderful. Thank you. Um, and uh, my next question is for Celeste and then we'll probably um, take some questions if anyone wants to drop any in the chat, we're uh, happy to look at the chat. So uh, go ahead and plunk your questions in if you have any. And um, so Celeste, if uh, you gather a lot of inspiration from objects and film, and notably recently rodeo material um, or rodeo material culture kind of, uh, and even though this isn't quite a culture that you have a lot of personal experience with, um, can you talk about what draws you to the objects associated with rodeo culture and um, and the images and what sort of what parts of your identity these things might be connecting to within you? Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to start by saying that some of the first artists I was interested in were photographers and filmmakers. So Cindy Sherman, Richard Prince, um, Hitchcock, Boonwell, and um, so I think I've always been attracted to photographers and filmmakers and the images they make. Um, and I think that there's this longstanding romanticism or fascination with the West, um, especially in film and photography. Um, and a lot of being an artist is finding, figuring out what you like, what you don't like, and then following those paths. So. I always like to draw horses. Um, I'm sure that a lot of people can relate to that when they were kids. Um, and that's something that I've just kept on doing, right? But um, then, you know, looking at like Richard Prince's Marlboro Man Cowboys, those photographs, there is this real romanticism or recognition of this kind of, um, American dream or what makes um, a, a certain narrative trope, right? And so I am kind of fascinated with that. And I'm also fascinated with the idea of subverting that and maybe how paintings can be used to subvert that ideal or that dream. Um, so um, looking at the belt buckles, for example, I think that there's this whole little narrative occurring uh, in this small space, which I love. And then um, I can kind of establish my own narrative with that object by painting it or setting it up in a different kind of still life or with different objects so that there's a different narrative between those objects occurring. Um, because painting becomes the translation of a narrative for me. Um, yeah, was there another part of your question? Um, I'm not sure I can go back to it, <laughs> but, uh, but thank you for that. Yeah, I was, I kind of um, am interested in the whole idea of like the belt buckles, for example, being these sort of little vignettes that capture a, a moment, but it's not really a specific moment. It's more of like a, an idealized or romanticized moment, like you were saying, and, yeah. and then interpreting that through painting um, sort of elevates it from being this, you know, it, it, what it's attempting to be, I guess, is an artifact in a way. Um, and then it becomes sort of like this, like you said, a, a visual translation or interpretation through the vessel that is you as the artist. Um, so. Yeah. Yeah, I find that to be um, really interesting that there's this kind of cycle um, or loop of, of imagery and objects and then, you know, back to an image that is an object again. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. Um, do we have any questions? We don't have any questions in the chat, so I can go back to... Um, to Divya real quick and just um, 
I have a I have a an interesting question for you, which is um, maybe a, a little strange, but we'll we'll dig into it. Um, so it's it's rare, but it's not completely unheard of for humans to be taxidermied. I was wondering what you think about human taxidermy and um, if you would ever be willing to do something like that yourself or um, if if you think it's it's ethical or unethical or you know what your feelings are about it. Um, that is that is an interesting question. Um, honestly, I think it's someone's choice. It's you know it's someone's own choice. So that's really the major you know the major part of it. Um, a lot of the trade in the past of human remains has been really unethical because it was tended to be. Um, poorer people from exploited countries that were, you know, that were used as educational specimens, um, not by choice. Um, so it's a really, you know, but it's really complicated because there is also knowledge gained from, you know, gained from these practices too. So it's a very, it's a very complicated, you know, situation in, in that case. Um, as far as now, if someone you know, if someone said, I would like to be preserved through the art of taxidermy when I pass, I think if that's their choice, they should, you know, they should have a space to, to carry out, you know, to carry out that choice and, um, you know, and to find someone who will take care of, to take care of them um, before, you know, as they, as they go on. Um, from a practical side, it would be very challenging because taxidermy is moving skin or arranging skin. So unlike a mummy, unlike plastination, um, it requires removing the skin from an animal, or in this case, it would be the human, and mounting it onto an anatomically accurate form. And our skin doesn't have a bunch of fur on it, or feathers, or even scales to hide any, you know, to sort of hide any imperfections that might be on the form. And there is like shrinkage and drying and stuff like that. So I guess from a practical side, it would be extremely challenging, um, unlike the previous you know, sort of preserved human remains that we've had through history. Um, so yeah, and as far as the as far as the ethics of it, if someone agrees to do that, if that's their, you know, if that's their will, if that's their choice, then, you know, I don't think it's, um, yeah, if, if it's someone's choice, then I guess it's not unethical because it was their choice, so. Well said, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, Kimmy, I can see that you're getting my attention. <laughs> um, it looks like we, yeah, thank you. Um, it looks like we have a question in the chat for all three artists. Uh, this is from M. Serna. So thank you for joining us. Um, so it, what they wrote is each of you seems interested in what lies beyond the story's end, memory, um, or death, can you talk a bit about your relationship to the resonant energy left behind and how you manage that connection? I suppose after death or, or the end of the story, resonant energy, if you um, can relate to that at all. Well, oh, you can, I was gonna say, um, I'm not sure about death, but when you finish a painting or the way I know when a painting is done is if um, it has kind of this energy that I'm okay leaving it with. So um, I know it's really hard to know if something's finished, at least for me with painting, but um, you know, you kind of know when you know it's this feeling, right? And I think that that energy stays in a piece of art um, and hopefully um, the viewer can see it um, when they look at it from a distance um, or close up. And so I, that doesn't speak exactly to death, but kind of to like moving on from something, um, how you move on from one piece to the next or one um, chapter maybe to the next chapter. So it's kind of like this uh, feeling of closure in a way, but in a way that allows the, the piece to live on. That's really interesting. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? 
question. Um, I, uh, I make these representations of, you know, organic remains interacting with the rhizosphere. So there's this, you know, visual breaking down of, of matter into another, or it's a, it's a, the beginning of the story, I guess, like the bones are still depicted as being intact. And, you know, the mushrooms haven't totally engulfed the forms in mold yet, but it's, it's going to happen like this. There's, a, you know, an intended event, I guess, inherent in what I'm depicting. Um, but since a lot of my work is about real versus fake or fabrication versus reality, you know, these are still handmade objects, you know, imitating an actual process of entropy. Um, but I, I kind of take, I, I find it makes me happy that, you know, the materials I use are all, you know, non-toxic and, you know, plant-based to an, you know, to the best of their abilities. Sorry, there's a train that just went right by my house. Um, I've been wondering when that train is going to go by during this talk. <laughs> and I was like, I've been just like clenching my body. That's why I, and it's, it, then it, there it goes. So I'm sorry. Um, no worries. I'm in the city and a siren was just like blazing earlier. So I can relate. <laughs> train. Goddamn train. Um, but yeah, I, I, I enjoy the fact that even though I've made this fake representation of a thing that happens, you know, on the forest floor, it's, it's still going to happen to this object eventually. Entropy will still claim these things I've made. I'm not a spiritual person. I don't really, you know, memory, I think is how people live on. That's how they, you know, I, I, I'm my, my space said I was agnostic. So, um, yeah, that says a lot about my views on that, but like, I, um, yeah, I, I, I like the fact that my, my work will also turn into ashes and dust eventually. If I don't know if that answers the question. I'm going to mute myself. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then I suppose the ashes and dust will have its own continuation of life <laughs> someday. Um, I don't know if you had any thoughts, Divya, on that question. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, pretty much what I uh, similar to what Caitlin said about the ashes and dust. Um, a lot of people see taxidermy as a way to sort of stop or prevent that. Um, but from myself seeing taxidermy that was made hundreds of years ago and seeing what can and can't be preserved and what is and isn't, you know, viable to to stay and live on and um, just as someone myself in my own personal life I love old things like I love vintage clothing I love antiques like everything everything I have around me or many of the things I have around me have had a previous life so I kind of enjoy that um, and I kind of like the stories that come with them and maybe the stories I'll leave going on with them um, and knowing that the stories will end and that I don't necessarily know what that ending will be. And I kind of find a really great peace in not knowing what that, you know, what that end is going to be, kind of like relinquishing the control. Yeah, I like that, um, that idea. And it, you know, I can relate from a personal experience of, um, so a little bit about like what kind of drove my practice uh, and why I'm kind of interested in these themes for the show is that I personally grew up around a lot of family heirlooms and particularly furniture that was in my family for many generations and uh, has very ornately carved wood and um, and then my mother is a you know an avid collector of all things pretty and decorative. And so I like grew up around this really visual cacophony of um, ornate, you know, floral figurines and dolls and, you know, pictures hanging on the wall and, uh, and things like that, just like these layers on top of layers. And, um, and my grandmother also passed away, uh, you know, not 
not too long ago. And so a lot of things that she collected, um, art that she made and um, things from her travels throughout the, the years uh, were passed down to lots of members of my family, including myself. So um, I think it does sort of have this, you know, I don't know if it's an energy or if it is just our memories or some kind of subconscious um, identity, you know, part of us, but uh, I definitely feel connected to something larger when I'm in the presence of um, an object that has that kind of history. Um, it looks like we're getting some advice from uh, Kate Testa in the chat that you should check out the Cowtown Rodeo yeah. this summer in South can I, Jersey. <laughs> can I respond to that? That's actually how I, um, I've been twice and that's actually what started me on the rodeo nice. um, series cool. was going to that, but I would love to go back. So thank you, Kate. <laughs> and, uh, and Emily, thank you for for that wonderful question. We got some great responses from the artists and, and she's also thanking the artists. So, um, and um, so I guess we have a few more minutes. I'm, I'm gonna see if there is a question that I haven't gotten to yet. Sorry, Kimmy, did you have something to add? Sorry, you're muted. Um, I just wanted to say when I first saw images of the show, I wasn't sure if there was going to be like any tongue in cheek or like irony about these objects like from from pop art to like Swedish death cleaning. There's been a lot of like discarding like bourgeois values and stuff like that. But I think you're authentically presenting them as like portals into stillness. And I think that's really interesting. Um, and there's this LCD sound system song where he talks about like, um, like nostalgia for the unremembered eighties. And I think you're, it's interesting that you're using these like crafts and like Victorian and like cowboys and embracing these like pre-industrial or like pre late capitalist like tropes that, that predate you. And I was wondering if you had like your own nostalgia for a time like that you haven't lived through, if that makes sense. Oh, I like that question. Anybody want to take that? Um, yeah, I also love that question. And I feel like I definitely have a nostalgia for a time I didn't live through. Um, like maybe a time without phones um, or quite as much technology. And like I was saying, the kind of romanticism of um, like, the land or um, the West being idea of something or the land being an idea of something or, um, you know, kind of um, also this film nostalgia, right, of when films were first made, of um, the evolution of film and photography, right, to be able to witness that is something that seems very like powerful to me. And now we're kind of in this era of um, not being past it, right? But we've we've done so much with it. Um, and so it's easy to look back and feel nostalgic about um, kind of the memory of what's left from those those years. I'm nostalgic for the very specific 1970s depiction of the Middle Ages or like a, a fantasy time that, that you would see in like a, like a Peter Cushing movie from 1973. Um, like the misty, like weirdly, very obviously polyester cloak of a woman riding a white horse over like a misty moor that's the, it's that's the I want to live there that's the time that I would give anything to enter honestly that's awesome M says Lady Hawk yeah I'll enjoy <laughs> <choice>, yeah. <laughs> great movie um 
I don't know if you had any thoughts, Divya. Um, there are times that I would maybe want to visit, but not really live there because <laughs> I just, I don't know. There's a lot of like, I don't know. Yeah, there's like a lot of, I guess, stuff in the past that I feel like I can always find something unsavory about it. Whereas like now I'm like, well, it's kind of, you know, things are are not perfect, but they're they're better. Um, I think probably the time in the past I feel most drawn to would be kind of like the early 90s. Um, just like the weird sort of like optimism, but also non-optimism that was there. Um, I really like that. <laughs> Still dial up internet. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. dial up internet era is, I think, um, yeah, the sort of like scheduling the time to go online, like that sort of uh, that sort of time in our lives. I feel like that is um, that's the time I'm nostalgic for. <laughs> I really love the um, the sort of 80s, late 80s, early 90s era of um, children's programming because you could get like weird and dark and it was like, okay, like the labyrinth and, you know, Pee Wee's Playhouse is, you know, just like so weird. And um, so I, I definitely have a sort of nostalgia for that time. And I kind of wrestle with nostalgia in a way because I think like, like you were saying, Divya, you can kind of pick and choose now what you want to embrace in terms of like vintage items or antiques and things like that. Um, and I think that there's something really special about um, the, uh, and I, I think that part of my connection to objects being, you know, passed down and heirlooms and things like that is because that was kind of what the, the women had to leave behind as a legacy, you know, in, in terms of their personal domestic crafts and the way that they, you know, furnished and decorated their homes and things like that. And because they couldn't, you know, exist in the public space as much, you know, I think in the, in the men's sphere of things, it was more of a, you know, property and titles and, you know, things like that were passed down. Whereas with us, it was more, um, the objects that were made and cherished. Um, and so uh, I wrestle with that kind of like the reasons behind that, but also really cherish, you know, the contributions that that we can enjoy today because of that, so. I'm not sure if you saw in the news, but like Ukrainians have been wrapping their statues and monuments and like fireproof wrapping to preserve them. And I thought that was really evocative and poignant. Um, and I was thinking about that in terms of your theme of immortality, because like with all that they're doing, that's probably the last thing I would be thinking, you know, I'd be like mm -hmm. evacuating, getting everyone out, but they're like, it's, you know, they're like, they're saying this is who we are and these have value in like these, mm -hmm. these monuments and these statues. And so I think that ties in really beautifully to this theme of like presenting these objects for contemplations, but you know speaking on themes of things that outlast us. Yeah, and it really speaks to the evidence of, you know, how important objects are that represent, you know, identities or, or things, you know, that, um, you know, we all exist in these like physical bodies, right? And, um, and there's limits to that, you know, we can only be in one time and place at a time and we can't necessarily, um, you know, represent all the parts of our identity at one time by by the clothes that we wear or things like that. So I think that we use objects a lot of times to supplement those things and um, and just to show how powerful that people are willing to risk their lives to preserve that stuff. Um, it's, it's really powerful to me. So. so thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, and to our artists for joining us and sharing their, their generous time and their, their work. They've put so much work and labor into all of the items that are in the show. And I hope that you all are able to make it. Again, the opening is tomorrow night from six to nine at our 1400 North American Street location in the Crane Arts Building. And um, we are also open from 12 to 5 every Saturday. And the show will be up through April 2nd. So um, thank you all so much. This was an awesome conversation. And we will be uh, posting this 
somewhere with a link um, on the website. So I'll be updating everyone on that. Thank you, Jackie. Jackie for moderating. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Everybody have a wonderful Wednesday and I hope to see as many folks as possible tomorrow in person at the gallery. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Have a good night. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.